Good morning. Isn't it marvelous to wake up and to have a friend in the garden as well as the dew on the leaves from uh, the Jardin Mouillet by Albert Roussel, perhaps? I know symbolism is already to place nature in poetry and music and then if I compare the symbolism of the wet leaves with the um, French art song that in fact <laughs> uses them symbolically <laughs> in turn I feel like it's a full circle of symbolism how silly of me but nevertheless the light on the on the dew of the leaves is just so incredibly refreshing as if everything restarts no matter what there will be always a tomorrow it's a promise of the future that comes in and that sometimes we take obviously for granted hopefully we do because if not it'll be really really disappointing and uh, hopeless but I like to think so. After the seasons restart, the spring, the morning restarts the day. Oh well, my cheap philosophy, for whatever it's worth in its poetry, imaginary, always connected to music. There is always a day somewhere when it's night here too. So we are in a perpetual day chasing the night and I find it incredibly beautiful to imagine that these trees also talk to each other through light and wet and uh, all the different ingredients uh, that nature um, nur nurtures them with not to mention our uh, gaze at them which of course doesn't nurture them but it nurtures our imagination you know, I find that so incredible to be able to um, imagine that we are given the rare opportunity to attend the miracle of life. When I have a deer going by the garden, I feel so honored. Most likely it's because I never go in my garden, which is so tiny anyway and I don't have the green hand to um, shape it and make um, this nature become domesticated for uh, aesthetic purposes of human nature. It's also because since I can't, then I enjoy it um, bloom its way, <laughs> um, relatively free to say the least, and so inevitably it becomes a little bit um, messy here and there, but that's okay. And so when the deer know that by experience they won't be disturbed in my garden by gardening, <coughs> they often come to visit and uh, find a safe haven from all the constructions going on around where more and more of their play terrain, or uh, their playgrounds rather, I meant to say, <laughs> sorry on my words, um, is reduced by all the new constructions. At least here they have a place where they don't have to worry about being disturbed by some gardener. I only garden my piano. Poor piano, it's getting all its juice out. An old upright I got from my daughter when she was a child to practice on temporarily. Everything temporary becomes <laughs> relatively foreverly. Just like the upright piano of my childhood, that Petrov. I find it very charming actually because it's so easy to. And of course, so much more rewarding to play on a concert grand when your pianist come on. 
vroom. It's like it feels under the fingers, you shape, you organize, it responds. Well, not always, but heavier action and all. <clears throat> But I think that um, this upright, uh, in this um, viral times where I don't have access to my studio, where the piano with the big lid are, is being a very, very good, good one to me. For the daily improvisations and the daily teaching. That statement that Mademoiselle used to keep around, uh, n'y a pas de mauvais piano, il n'y a que des mauvais pianistes, I find to be a little bit over <laughs> overstated, in fact. There is no bad pianos, there are no bad pianos, only bad pianists. I don't trust that to be so true. I like my leaves, they cover my bald head with a feel of nature. I like um, the early morning because the rays of the sun are so promising, so gliding on the objects they lit. There's some sense of legato in mezzo piano dynamic range, I would say. The introduction of the piano part in the Jardin Mouillé by Roussel, the wet garden. It always fascinated me because I was um, always impressed how those French composers of melodies, as they call them, uh, French art songs, managed to create an atmosphere out a few notes that immediately sets the sound the painting um, the um, yeah the atmosphere of this um, Claire de Lune by Fauré, piano introduction to the song. And then there is the most amazing of all, that is not a French art song, if not most, because obviously there's no hierarchy, but one very dear to my heart and I'm sure to many people is Montnach by Schumann. The introductions are um, invitations to the poem, invitations to the storytelling, invitations just creating in few very brief notes an amazing atmosphere that brings you to, to be ready to receive the words, which is the purpose of the art song anyway. I find that fascinating. It's almost like a micro overture of a micro opera of a micro drama of a micro daydream. Everything is micro, but in fact, it doesn't look, feel, or appear so small because it just takes its place. It lays in the soul, and you go, Oh, yeah, I want to hear that. And when you know them, they become friends, and they return to see you, and they look at you, and they go, huh, what happened, huh? I'm still here, arrogantly young. Mm. We age, and the 
companionship with the artwork shows us how the artwork <clears throat> doesn't age, <laughs> in fact. It looks at us saying, ah, you remember when you looked at me when you were young and a child perhaps, and now that you're old, I'm still splendid and fresh and inviting you to come again and share the few minutes of our poem together that talks about life through nature or Isn't that amazing? And so touching to have companionship that brings alive every time a different season of our lives the uh, truths of um, the expression of poetry, the music, and other art forms, in fact. Nothing is frozen in time. They just re-reveal themselves alive to us. In truth, I find truly, really, <laughs> that the French art songs express so completely in complete fusion, the text with the music, um, the way the leader do in German or through German, the music of the language, the music of the composers of the language, it's the expression of um, the composer's um, complete unison with the language's um, poetic meaning and music sounds. It doesn't have to be somebody who is born in that language, somebody who adopts it as well, as my case is when I wrote my French art songs, because in a way it connects you through words to um, things that you only can express with notes and in a way the notes don't reflect the words nor do the words uh, sit with the notes. They seem to just be side by side or facing each other. Oh. I adore that form of the French art song. I think it is making the language more beautiful and the meaning of the language b more meaningful because beautiful. It's always a question about how much you put meaning in beauty and how much beauty in meaning. I find it necessarily disturbing to always try to find meaning in everything, especially in language is based on the fact of transmitting meaning. And then in poetry, it's like as if you take the notes and you don't put them together in a in an order of tonal system and the same thing with words oh yes on the surface they sound like something i love when kids in school as we had to recite poems that we don't understand we just say the words to train our memory sometimes we do the same with music we just play notes and we recite them, but sometimes we have to put a meaning in them that it means to us, regardless if it's perhaps not the right intended one by the composer and the great performers. In a way, it's a personal connection. Perhaps wrong, but so appealing, which I find terribly interesting when I have students who misread a note and um, I try to make sure they understand that I'm not at all upset about it because I want to make sure they complete their own musicianship with a sense of not ownership of the score, but that um, they keep self-esteem and not feel um, scolded for misreading the notes. I think it's like misguessing. These are the Jardin Mouillet leaves. I like the idea that a student doesn't make per se a mistake. Of course they do. Um, 
carelessness, tiredness, misunderstanding of the harmonic um, language leads you to misread the note. That's true. But to misguess is different. I think um, most of us read the music with our ears rather than our eyes. We play it with our fingers on the piano and it immediately somehow reveals itself through our own level of decoding the connections between the indication and what we hear in the result that we play. And because of uh, intuition and and often used expression of similar situations, we assume the note is this or that, and then when we are revealed by the teacher that it isn't, then we still say, well, I liked it the way I liked it. And now I have to like it the way the composer really liked it. Of course, there's no question that you have to play what is written, because if not, then write your own, as Mademoiselle would tell me, and I didn't shy. But the fact is, is that on the spot it seems so connected and so true and then you feel like, oh, I'm going to fix it, but I still liked it my way because I spent so many times playing it. So perhaps I misunderstood the poetry uh, for so long. I misunderstood the symbolism and the meaning of a painting. I misunderstood the innuendos of this um, inharmonic modulation. I, um, but I didn't misunderstand, I just understood it for what I wished it to be, in a way. Isn't it like in human relations? We fall in love uh, and we hope that the object of our love will represent what we place in loving, <laughs> emotionally, and that it doesn't always respond the way we expect it to be, the object in question. Uh, because it's a human or it's a... Well, even if it's a pet, um, I like the idea that people start thinking often that, um, except the true animal lovers, they really um, dialogue with their animals. They don't just uh, have a monologue that is based on um, the necessity of affection versus the necessity of nutrition. <laughs> That's a bit simplistic, and I'm sure there is more subtlety to that. But it is true that we all project ourselves into what we love, wish, desire, hope, imagine, dream, um, become, even Im in imagination. And I find that a student or a pianist, a performer, a teacher, whoever, at whichever season of our lives, we sit in front of the piano, all of a sudden the piece is displayed in front of us in some kind of ephemeral blueprint. And we just go through it and we visit it through different uh, sensorial expectations of our psyche, of our soul, of our imagination, of our mood setting. And then we try to translate it thinking that we are right or wrong or correct or or all these things. But in fact, we just respond to the sheer soul shiver it gives us. And I think that if we accept it, we can accept to be less precise. Well, not in fine, of course, we want to be precise and right and profound and true and, and clean and correct. And um, all of this together. But I don't think while we do it, it matters so much. To me, what matters the most when we do it is to be responding to the kind of emotion that it brings us. I'm obviously always talking about emotion when most people will talk about reason. And I understand that it's very important to people to, to reason, to make sense, to um, organize to control perhaps, but mostly to um, to bring things to a fruition. And this fruition could be uh, recording of music or uh, composing in music or performing something that you organize or you... Uh, in fact, 
it's all about the beginning and an end. And in between the two, there is this concentrate of life. Um, as dreamed, as imagined, as hoped by our predecessors. And that has some kind of incredible reality of today for us. I'm very touched by their giving us the opportunity to feel those emotional and intellectual actually too. Um, strong uh, feelings of um, expressions for the humanity that comes throughout. I always think about these words, humanity, emotion, uh, drive, hope, um, daydream, um, and that goes together with um, um, nostalgia. Not only because we regret our youth, or perhaps also, but because we relieve with our understanding of the ephemeral beauty of the now and at the time when we were young the now was forever in front of us and I find that um, it's a very touching emotion to revisit one's earlier seasons even in daydreams like Brahms did in his late intermezzi in his life like we can do um, in a book or in a poem or in a painting and sometimes we don't have to do it at all just think of it and it brings us a f oh, feeling like this and it's all that it is to it already the autumn is calling it's yellow leaves show where we're going goodbye summer hang on a little more <laughs> oh what's the point to hope there will be another summer perhaps but meanwhile we have to go through another round of all these autumn leaves ah. how amazingly powerful this clock of nature is and how peaceful on the surface it is here now, this minute, compared to all the other calamities that it can produce or man help produce, alas. Playing with nature in a bad sense of gameplay. But you know, it's reassuring to know that Nature is so resilient, perhaps humans too, actually, finally. I believe that. And I like to imagine that like the branches of the tree, we are all spreading around the life's line and we just try to rise as high as we can before we go back down to the ground. Oh, I know, it's easy philosophy. But I think most of us think about those things inside our heads. We don't just say it because it's silly. And of course, philosophers, poets, writers said it way better. So what? We're just ourselves. We can experience it even if we don't have to word it. I find music to be the perfect expression for all things we can't say, think, verbalize, or necessarily organize. They just oh, are like gifts that come to our soul. And we should acknowledge them more than we do. At least I will try my best to do so uh, with my students and 
with myself. After all, once a student, always a student. <laughs> Here is my introduction to one of my art songs about uh, <clears throat> Harmonie du Soir by Baudelaire. <laughs> That's the voice part. on the piano part, commenting the voice. the question of the questions, in my case. What to do with the ostinato? Oh well, the ostinato, that has been my dilemma since I started music because Mademoiselle Boulanger pointed it right away in the first lesson when I was writing my concerto in D about my distinato or restinato, or ostinato obviously, and then I wrote mistinatos and solstinatos and lastinatos and on every note. It seems like she told me it's a Slavic um, music um, expression, soulful, something intuitive, something not learned. Uh, of course, Bach has for the organ pieces especially this very long lasting, not pedal um, holding um, that is an ostinato in a way also in no Slavic at all, though they claim he had Hungarian heritage, but that's not Slavic. Anyway, that's another story for musicologists to discover. I was just trying to say that Mademoiselle Boulanger specifically wanted me to learn already as a child composer how to move melodically my bass line instead of staying, as she would say, sitting on a couch and moving on another couch from an ostinato of one note to the other. Now she did it herself in her own music like Vers la Vie Nouvelle, um, in that sense very Rachmaninovian, which is awkward to say given her history with him around Pugnot in uh, Moscow in 1913. But beyond these personal situations that she had with men composers and women composers as well actually, she always had this kind of distanciation to judge and therefore for me it was to learn how to move the bass line melodically. Basically, all the lines move, all the layers. That was her idea, Gregorian and onwards. And that um, factually, in Lily's music, uh, her sister, there is a lot of ostinato. 
in Mademoiselle's music. It's a lot of ostinata, that organ piece that she wrote on the Flemish themes also. So, is it um, an element of music that is to be um, thought, accepted, or um, dealt with? In my opinion, she didn't leave me a clear indication because as she was strict about part writing and contrapoint fugue harmony, um, concentrated um, intellectual understanding of the meaning of the voice leading, especially if you do it on keyboard harmony when you play a continuo. But she still remained extremely free compared to that strictness when it came to this situation. So if you feel like you write perfect fifths and octaves, you could also feel like writing um, ostinato. If it corresponded, as she would say, whatever it was, in your creativity, it has to be natural to the expression of what you have to state musically. So if it is, you do. But you don't do it for doing it. In other words, it's not the language that determines the essence of or the statement or the intent of the um, thought process of the piece as a compositional development. But it was because you had to express something, you will be modal, or because you wanted to express something, it would be tonal, or because you wanted to express something, it might be a little bit of both. In other words, not doctrinary, not ideologized, but just in a way, adapting to the inspiration. And if one piece is tonal and the next piece is atonal, both with conviction and sincerity. I know it sounds a cheesy word, and honesty, but sincerity, I think, is something in art is easy to understand. You feel it right away when you hear it. And you feel it too when you hear it when it's missing. Oh, that's just artificially made. Or then this is, oh, like a hug. Oh, like an Im imperishable memory of a perfume or of a gaze of somebody who touched you by their humanity, their personality. Their pers so the music leaves on you these kind of grooves in your soul, at least in me, deeply, 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 deeply. deeply. The grooves in the soul. Oh. Until today, I consider that um, would they be moving by octaves, repeated or held, uh, on top or in the middle or the bottom, this kind of static continuity of the sound on which or around which, under or above which, you build a harmonic progression, a melodic line, a combination of melodic lines in dialogue with a harmonic progression um, or some kind of virtuosic arpeggiation, whatever it is that it takes, you do it because you feel like on that route or on that suspended route, so to say, when you have the, um, let's say, like Bach does in the second part, mi fa sa fa mi re do mi re do si sol, re mi fa mi re do si re do si la sol, do re mi re do si la do si la sol sol, si do re do si la sol la bemol. So <clears throat> you can do it uh, alternatively suspended. You can have it in the middle, or you can have it nowhere. And what is really striking about this is that. Um, She, in a way, informed me very early in my compositional creativity that it's not anything goes because you're creative and anything is for, everything is forbidden, therefore you have to figure out a way when it's an example of an exercise for a um, knowledgeable um, uh, art form. No, no, no. It was really about separating tolerance from forbidden. That means you allow it, but you don't take it for granted. And it has to be within the... Because if not the, uni the unison, sorry, <laughs> the, um, the um, um, 
ostinato then becomes a facility. It's easier to build things on the unmoving floor or root or ground. In the Russian or Slavic church tradition uh, of the um, Orthodox Christianity, um, there was only sung, not organ, and when it was sung, one of the singers would hold a bass note upon which the other um, congregation members would sing most likely four parts um, chants of the psalms and all that. But in a way, we're producing what an organ does, like Bach did at least. But when it's moving within the structure, up and down, or going from the top to bottom, for instance, the Nocturne by Lily Boulanger for violin and piano, for instance, that's an incredible ostinato in the opening. But on the dominant, with the second degree, like Schumann's uh, Montnacht or Fantasy, or um, uh, for Chopin's opening of the Bach Carole. Every time you have this kind of expectation, but without the resolution or delayed resolution at the end of the piece, you start on the dominant and you plan the second degree minor chord and you obtain not a, a dominant ninth, which it should be because you don't have the third, but really um, a superimposition of a root, which would be the dominant, and then a second degree, which would be the triad, and in that case you have a ninth and a seventh between the root and oh, it, it gives you a sense of open mind waiting, open expectation. And that's what Lily does in the Nocturne introduction for violin and piano. Sometimes it functions great in the French art songs too. To establish the mood in a, an ostinato helps so much. To do it right away, within a bar or two. Also, it helps the singer to figure out where is the note that they'll start singing from by comparing it to this one that you play, unless it's the same one. I think Mademoiselle Boulanger was a very respectful person for every of her students' um, creative, um, intuitive background calling. And while combining it with knowledgeable um, organization of the sounds or the thought processes, she tended to be very respectful to not lose that intuitive first opinion of how it comes to you before you will you go ah no i shouldn't do that because it's an ostinato oh, i shouldn't do that because mademoiselle boulanger said that i shouldn't do it <clears throat> i think she trusted the real creators to not be so listening to her <laughs> advices Perhaps she didn't really either follow the ones she was given. Since she wrote herself, student of Fauré, she was music that has ostinatos. Her own Slavic side for her Russian mom, I would assume, if it were to be so genetic and not only cultural. Or perhaps a combination of both in that case. For her and somewhere for me too it was so marvelous to have a teacher who truly cared and truly listened to your own self-search and then would give you advice how to progress into that that you were somehow pursuing. Most teachers either appear to be uninterested, bored, distant, at best polite, if not arrogant, 
and if not they just want to be pleased by being copied and imitated which in a way helps their ego but ultimately doesn't solve anything because the student remains in the same situation of wondering what to do how much of what should I give in or give uh, or hold back my intuition is it by essence bad or by essence right <laughs> just because it's intuitive and sometimes when you go to study is to in a way erase some of the intuition if not you don't need to study you just follow your in instinct and then the teacher can say yeah but there are lengths oh you have to be restating it but not too often and perhaps in a different way organize your thoughts um, organize the thematic material start becoming a little bit of a surgeon of the material and fix it around organize it around if you write a fugue or a sonata form or you free yourself into another type of cyclic form um, form nevertheless so it starts becoming like an um, injection of thought within what was only intuition sometimes intuition doesn't bring you too far because it starts well <laughs> then where does it go where does the second, third stand sentence, um, phrase, line lead you to from? Do you go back? Is it a vicious circle? Can you get out of there? Are you supposed to go somewhere? And if yes, where? When? What is the climax? At which point you expect it? Would you make a heartbreaking modulation? Are you being atonal anyway? In which case you go by some kind of sense for space rather than for hierarchy of notes they're just um, organized in a different uh, set of meaning and when you do a French art song or a leader German one or even a Russian art song or any language in which you write an art song wow then it becomes something special because then you combine and the intuitive and the literary and the musically organized thought process so you have the language with the poetry for the text and then you have the music with the form for the knowledge and then you have the inspirational melodic line that espouses the words in a way that the words are not engulfed but they are presented and the melodic line depicts what you are saying with the words without to explain them since you have anyway in the piano part some kind of a harmonic coating which at some level gives you a, a setting upon which you express yourself. So in fact then you combine literary, musical, harmonic, melodic, pianistic for the instrument and breathing for the singer, organization of pacing, spacing, directing, phrasing, meaning directing, the arrival point, the, the point, uh, the punctuation of the music. I find when all of these blend so smoothly as if they are always been together, is that you have a high level of allowing your intuition to mingle with your knowledge. Not your knowledge uh, organizing only, but nor your intuition um, free floating only but finding a way where they complete complement uh, harmoniously they don't need to be put in competition they just exist and I find that to be very 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 inspirational when you play a piece or you hear a piece or you sing a piece that has that oh my god that intends, entails a certain um, subtlety in the choice of what you're going to express from the text. After all, the text was there before the music you're going to add, unless you write the text yourself, of course. But if you set a text, the text was there before, it has its own music, its own rhythmicity, its own pulse, its own um, modulations in vowels and consonants, not to mention in meanings. And then, so you have the, 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 the sound of the words, the meaning of the lyrics in question, within the choice of words for their sounds, and I don't speak only of rhymes, but in every aspect of 
b number of syllables and how it flows or how it um, fights the text how the piano part is not always reflective of the mood of the words but sometimes purposely in opposite direction of the sound um, painting rather um, sound provoking and then you hear words that don't correspond to a certain aesthetic that would immediately correspond to tender or harsh or happy or sad or nostalgic or driven or hopeful or hopeless that is too drastic and unsubtle it's more interesting when you have this it's not more interesting the truth is that it's more taking so how you combine in your soul in your mind a given word within a given group of sound notes that are to be sung combined with a musical um, accompaniment which either will hug them harmonically either will perhaps accompany them in uh, other voices in combination hmm. you can have several of all and and you have to make sure that um, the singer feels um, comforted by the accompaniment and not um, sometimes it could become but hopefully not for too long not fighting the piano part or unless the text speaks of feisty situations and then you re you you you, you sound paint them like that but i find that to take in account the sound of the words before their meaning to combine them to the sounds of music before their organization in terms of tonal model or even un, unorganized for the atonal or organized differently for the serial and then define the spectrum um, make the choices and bring the melodic the spoken the harmonic and the suggested gestural um, intentions on the piano and the voice combined either walk in parallel either in opposites or go exponentially expanding it's a fascinating um, realm of possibilities and not all of them are obvious after all nothing is obvious except intuition actually you know it is supposed to be you don't know why you don't know where it will go but you can't not do it because it corresponds deeply to what you had to say if not there's no point but the question is then at which point can you enhance it develop it uh, bring it to its fruition without to pass through a certain amount of tricks that you've learned and I, I perhaps shouldn't have said tricks knowledgeable <laughs> thought process techniques in music uh, which you only learn best by copying a score of somebody else you immerse yourself in the thought process of the other composer and then it's like a highway directly to the heartland of the piece through your own understanding as if you composed it of course you know you didn't but compared to playing it singing it um, or performing it in groups it's nothing compared to writing it sinking in it in its in its writing form and from there on extracting yourself to learn how to play it or sing it or conduct it or rehearse it in other words others play you play somebody plays or sings but the flow and the follow-up of the voices and the lines and the melodic and the harmonic and the model and all that I think that's the key to it is to find the balance that is so harmonious in the sense that it's so natural according to the texture or the text or your your desire to to coat it in it oh. sometimes you find that perhaps for a few bars it's already lucky no it's not lucky is that you allow your intuition to guide you and your knowledge not to self um, cancel you your intentions so easy to say so difficult to do or to dare rather 
It is true that it is easy to say, difficult to dare. I couldn't say that better, in fact, because at some point you have to choose to dare. And who decides when is right? And who decides when it's necessary and when it's um, just perhaps um, lack of better judgment? Or a certain arrogance? Or is it arrogant by essence to think that what you write musically has a value to remain, regardless if people will use it as a remaining art form? Uh, perhaps in absolute terms we should not. But in fact, we reach a point where we dare because we think that very humbly, though, and not uh, ironically, um, arrogantly, we think that it's good, meaning it's right, meaning it's sincere, I think, personally, in those terms. Honest, sincere, um, in osmosis with the art form that you express, through which you express what you have to express in music with or without uh, words, with or without expressing another form for the, through the music, with or, with or without chamber music, dancing, singing, or all of the above, opera, art song, film music, um, computer music, um, anything. The um, soundtrack of life, basically, when you're honest. I, that's what I feel. But who defines that it's honest? And who can, in the eye of the beholder, obviously, but in the eye of a critique um, or of, a, of somebody who doesn't like this aesthetic, they'll say, nah, it's worthless. Already been done. Nothing new. As if only innovation matters, and for some people it does. I was often given this kind of um, definitive judgments like, this kind of thing has been done for at least a century. Do something innovative. I'm very impressed when people do something innovative, but not for the sake of it. Perhaps it is just something that people do when their language and their intent necessitates a new way of saying it. And others use the existing alphabet of music to express what they have to say. That's a very interesting um, point of view. What and when you choose how. It's not the means that matter, it's the purpose through how you express your, your inner world, in fact. What you hear inside, how do you extract it, how you're sure that you're not distracted by the effects, the tricks, the um, capacity to show off that you can write a tunnel or you can, you can try to impress. Um, who do you impress, in fact? Nobody. Perhaps you just cheat yourself. And if you have nothing to say, then perhaps you shouldn't say it until you find something meaningful to say and then find the meaningful connection of this saying. I find that when you find that combination, you're true to yourself. You're really true to yourself. Oh, what can I say? Probably nothing. <laughs> because I've thought about this for so long time, and I found that even if I can detect in a piece to another of mine some kind of a depth, more chromatic, less chromatic, more diatonic, less diatonic, combination of this, proportions of that, it's not just mainstream one or the other. It's not groundbreaking, that's for sure. Perhaps it's just because I'm old fashioned and I find an expressive melodic line to be humanly touching and that meaning perhaps overwhelms the modernity or the or the um, language through which you will state it and I think people who can state things with modernity are to be admired 
but I'm just not one of them for mine. Perhaps I'm too traditional, perhaps I don't have an innovative taste. I don't openly fight it. Perhaps um, ultimately I should think about doing it one day before I die after all. Who knows? I'm not narrow-minded. Far from there. That I can honestly say. But when Mademoiselle Boulanger was teaching composition, I think she was not just teaching composition, she was teaching uh, ethics about how you express yourself in music, what kind of devices you use, and for what purpose. There was a... I think she, she, she cherished a lot the... Um, perhaps not honesty in music, but at least a certain level of um, um, the means matching the inspiration, not overwhelming it, not undermining it. Hmm. I don't know. I realize this path is a little bit too difficult for me to pass through because <laughs> the exuberant green nature has barraged partly my uh, side little garden area so I cannot go through this it's okay I'm glad to have brought you with me sharing my thoughts I admire those who can open new, if certainly not new, at least innov innov innovative paths in music making, music creating, music playing, music thinking, music analyzing, music organizing the thoughts. All these things are so essential to keep the open mind about. I don't want to give up on that. Perhaps I'll find a way. I state with you my thoughts, but I certainly am not thinking that my teacher would have wanted me to be um, rigid intellectually, let's put it this way at least, I think. There was something about about remaining true to yourself, but open-minded. She used to have her opinions, of course, in aesthetics, and that was very important to her. But as a teacher, she didn't impose them. Or you could guess them between the lines when she would speak about them. I don't know. I think to a certain extent she was a woman of conviction, of innovation and of adaptation to students' desires and opinions in terms of um, how to express themselves.
I mean, she was so close to the creativity of Stravinsky, evolving through different styles, neoclassical, post-Russian earlier. Did she admire him musically because she loved him personally? Was she biased to accept or suggest some things in his development? I don't think she had the power to decide over him for doing neoclassical or not, when. She's credited for being influential over this for him. But I don't know that's possible. I think both her and him were extremely strong-minded individuals. I doubt that they accepted each other to be in any way or shape influenced by the opinion of the other. And then there is the fact that Stravinsky probably didn't feel comfortable having a woman next to him who is his equal in terms of musical hearing, capacity of thinking. I think he was, of what I understand, a macho man, no matter what, you can say. And that is okay, Brahms was too. And uh, that's independent from the kind of geniuses a Tchaikovsky was or a Verdi was or... I think we just accept for the kind of humans they were, because in a way they lived in their time. Rachmaninoff, even you know, in an old-fashioned composing way compared to his time composing, but timeless, in fact, compared to uh, the fact of his inspiration. I am very thankful to Mademoiselle Boulanger for not obliging me to become a little Fauré, nor a little Stravinsky, nor a little anything of the ones that she admired. The point was not to imitate them. In her opinion, the point was to um, learn from them. Like when you copy the score of a piece and you learn about the thought process. I think the thought process was for her more important than the thought itself. Because any thought is interesting, but how you organize, how you follow it, how you develop it, where it leads you. How it becomes so self-evident that people adopt it for their instrument or their um, musical tastes outside of any chronology events of modernity or old-fashionedness while they were written. How they take it for the timelessness that it's in them. I find that to be properly, properly inspirational. I have to close the gate. Anyway, the deers go over it. I think it was a D flat resonance like a bell that metallic aspect of it. Ding. I don't know, I lost some of my perfect pitch since I listened to so much Baroque music teaching in a Baroque seminar in semitone lower than 440. The beginning it bothered me and now in fact I adjusted to it so much that I have to make sure that I now do a little bit of transposing in order to re-establish the real pitch. It's a paradox to have a perfect pitch or to have had it or received it <laughs> and then to add a portion of um, a proportion of um, relative pitch to identify it better. Strange, isn't it? 
In fact, the most difficult is to organize it in terms of the notes you play compared to the notes you hear. So when I hear them, I don't imagine them as a keyboard, like all people who have perfect pitch. But when you think it is an instrumental performance and somebody plays a piece that you teach or play, and you wonder, why is it not in the right key? But in fact it is. And it turns out that Bach must have dealt a lot with these things because he had organs in different churches to play which are tuned up to a third of difference they say. So a pretty thing in G minor could have sounded in E minor while playing it in G minor, which personally would have bothered me a lot. Because it's a sort of a lost in translation, or in transposition rather. But he must have adjusted to it. He had to. Or perhaps he didn't have perfect pitch, which is to me awkward to imagine, but perhaps it is the case after all. Who's to know? Who's to know? But when you hear his music, oh my god. Oh. <laughs> Honey to the soul. Consolation. Solace. It's always like as if he's church music mainly, his religious, his sacred music, as if it always says it's going to be okay. At least that's how I hear it. That ostinato opening of Lily Boulanger's Nocturne for Violin and Piano is fresh and mysterious, tender and distant. In a way, it is constantly questioning us, and the ostinato by octaves creates a sense of sort of circle going around, up and down, that gives us a sense almost of cradling when you place the second degree over the dominant of F major and then expecting the final resolution of the tonic. That's exactly what um, Chopin does with the opening of the Barcarolle. That's what Mademoiselle Boulanger was uh, so admirative of Schumann doing in his song um, Montnacht. Opening as well as his uh, fantasy opening. <laughs> the importance that it's not a dominant ninth because there is no leading tone. It's a second degree minor triad over the dominant degree, that is the dominant harmonic pedal. It's in a way almost pentatonic without the leading tone or the triton that results from it, the tension release. No, it's just a opening to the world. Emilie Boulanger. And I find that once you enter in this kind of um, sound painting, really, you understand, well, you don't understand, but you try to, <laughs> while playing it, get a little bit closer to the atmosphere it creates, more than only the thought process of this degree into that degree regardless what it's called. It's what it feels, what it suggests, what it tells us um, psychologically. Tension, the delay, the expectation, the major, the minor, the, the expectation, and then a delay response. 
in speaking of ostinato. This is Mademoiselle Nadia Boulanger's. Dostinato. In her Vers la Vie Nouvelle to the New Life. Dostinato, but into the tenderness in Mademoiselle's, uh, into the darkness and the mm, brooding. Oh, and then, of course, after the um, climax of the uh, darkness in the opening, she has also this kind of Nocturne et Vie Boulanger style realization in the Vers la Vie Nouvelle when it's. Um, I find that to be incredibly um, deep, meaningful. She knew she allowed it to herself. She didn't deny it to herself if she felt she had to write that. Even if she was the scholar student of uh, Faure since childhood. And when she asked me to think about the melodic movements, like in the 13th Nocturne of Fauré, all the voices move constantly. had to say, she had to state, she didn't cancel, she didn't cross my piece by saying over it now, she didn't um, deny my inspiration which was with ostinato and I was still <laughs> yeah, the opening of my concerto when I was 10. So obviously she uh, made me understand it's okay that's what you are that's where it comes from deep in you but on the side try to think about layers voicing let's work on it academically so methodically and start to organizing like her beloved four voice mass by bird and follow each voice Slide moving in for a seventh nocturne. inspiration, what powerful emotion, what powerful thought process, what focus, what concentration of energy, of forces, of spiritual forces to reach to the heart of what you think your thought, your, your essence is, 
when you want to extract it from you and put it on a paper and hope that what is there written will mean enough to be put alive by another person for whom it might matter perhaps differently but very much and for sure differently is when we serve the dead composers of the past it was truly lovely to have you around my little garden and my thoughts and reminiscences of Mademoiselle Boulanger. Seems all my life is theme and variation of reminiscences of the purpose of the thoughts of Mademoiselle Boulanger and their wisdom adapted to my age now and to my students in turn. And hopefully this transmission would have been the purpose, in fact, of receiving so much from her in order to give valuably not what she would have, but through me, what I can perceive is the essence of the, each student's individual drive and calling. Thank you.